All right. Well, I, I don't want to go over too much more uh, new material before the exam. And this is not really related uh, to acid base equilibrium. Uh, equilibrium is at play in everything, of course. So we'll point out some of the, the connections between thermodynamics and equilibrium as we get to them. So what I want to do is just do a, a, a short um, recap of what we talked about yesterday and maybe go on a little bit further and, and uh, knock off early. Uh, so uh, yesterday we took a look back at Chem 200 for some of you and um, looked at thermochemistry, which deals with heat capacities and calorimeters um, and some of the other important things that we pointed out uh, last time. So to study thermodynamics, which is the energy criterion and energy that's involved in chemical reactions, uh, we need to define places where energy can exist. So in the simple definition of where energy can exist, it's either in the system or the surroundings and together that makes the universe. We said that um, some things like internal energy, which we give the symbol E, uh, are state functions, which just means that it doesn't matter how it became what it is. It just matters what state it's in at that time. And so at this time, some final state, we find its energy, some initial state, we find its energy, we take the difference and that's just the change in the internal energy. So we can, we can do that for uh, systems that uh, are state functions, as opposed to other things that we've introduced here, which is Q and work, which are not necessarily state functions. Uh, they're path dependent. And so we, um, we gave an example uh, of a ball sliding down some surface, if this surface is, has a lot of um, bumps in it, then friction is going to occur. And you would imagine that there's going to be more of a heat transfer. So Q is going to be different as opposed to when it, it's almost frictionless and there's minimum heat generated. Um, we talked about how the signs of Q and W work uh, can be associated with delta H, uh, exo and endothermicity. Uh, so you know from Chem 200 that an exothermic reaction gives off heat, and that's evidenced by a rise in temperature of the surroundings or the, the water, and vice versa for endothermic. It absorbs heat, so the temperature goes down. Uh, we said that under special conditions of constant pressure, uh, actually it's not that special because all the experiments that you do in our lab is uh, under constant pressure. Uh, it's atmospheric pressure and that doesn't really change. Uh, so under those conditions, uh, Q is related directly to um, enthalpy, H. So we, we made that um, analogy and said, well, we know something from Chem 200 about the sign of enthalpy and exothermicity, delta H. When um, a reaction is exothermic, we know delta H is negative and that's the same with Q. And when it's positive, Q is positive. And then we've said, well, it's no different for work um, than it is for heat. Uh, when heat's given off, Q is negative. When the system does work, or work is given off, you could think of it, uh, then work is negative. And when something does work on the system, then uh, work is positive. So we can sort out the signs of Q and W um, through association with enthalpy. 
All right, so I'm just going through the, these pretty quick. If if you guys have any questions, by all means, you know, just holler. Uh, and then we came to this uh, slide, which showed us some of the uh, properties of enthalpy and how it changes, for example, when you change the stoichiometric coefficient. And we said, well, geez, that makes sense. If I'm going to burn twice the amount of methane, then I should get twice the amount of energy out, you know, so that makes perfect sense. Uh, we said that um, chemists and scientists call this property a, an extensive property because it's amount dependent. If you burn twice as much, you're going to get twice, of, twice as much of that property. Um, and then we said, well, for this um, relationship, you have to watch out because these uh, thermodynamic properties like delta H, and later on we'll see a few new ones uh, like delta G, Gibbs free energy, and delta S, uh, the change in entropy, which are all uh, big players in thermodynamics. They're all state functions, and so you have to be careful about what you're talking about as far as the states being consumed or produced. So you see here that water's being produced and it's liquid in this uh, equation, but here it's gas. So gas has more energy than, than liquid, so you'd expect less energy to be given off and that's what we, we see. Uh, so it's a state function and you have to be careful of what states you're using when you look up these parameters in the textbook and you will have to do that to solve some problems. And then the, the last thing that we mentioned was the, um, the, the delta H. And this is true for any other thermodynamic properties, which we haven't looked at yet, that are state functions. That when you interchange the reactants and products, uh, essentially you change the sign of that uh, state function or that thermodynamic quantity, delta H. And we'll see later delta S and G. Uh, and then we went on to say, well, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we can calculate these thermodynamic properties, for example, delta H, without having to go to the lab? And um, I didn't mention this yesterday, but this is also going to be true for all the other thermodynamic properties. So we just use enthalpy as an example uh, because I think you're more familiar with enthalpy, and then the rest just fall in line afterwards. All right, so we said, yeah, there's a way to do this, the way to calculate the, the um, delta H or exo or endothermicity of a reaction without having to go to the lab. We can use published values. And the way this is done is by invoking these two uh, concepts. One is Hess's law, which we said, oh, well, that's, that's pretty easy. Uh, Hess's law essentially says if I want the delta H of a reaction, which I don't have, but I have delta H's of other reactions that when I add them up equal the one that I have, then I can just add up their delta H's. So that was Hess's law, and we looked at that um, last time. And now the delta H of formation idea. This idea um, sets a standard for enthalpy. And the standard is a zero mark. It's like, you know, when we measure mountain heights, we, we measure it um, according to its height relative to sea level. But we could have measured that height relative to the center of the earth or some other reference, you know, as long as we measured everything relative to the same reference, then we would get an idea of the height differences of mountains. This is the same idea. What we do here for the delta H formation is we say that all the elements in the periodic table that exist the way they do in nature, under standard conditions, and I'll remind you of standard conditions, it's just one atmospheric pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, 
um, you have a pretty good idea of the way elements exist. And the periodic table tells you that, how they exist, because some periodic tables are color coded. So the black elements are solids uh, under standard conditions. The red ones are, are gases, and the blue ones are usually set aside for liquids like mercury, uh, bromine, uh, et cetera. Um, so by just looking at the periodic table, we should remember uh, how these elements exist. For example, fluorine exists under standard conditions as a homonuclear diatomic gas. Uh, and so anything like that that we understand exists under standard um, conditions is assigned zero for its delta H of formation because we don't have to put in any energy and no energy comes out. It just exists that way. So it seems like a natural um, place to make a standard of zero. We'll just call that zero. And what this gets us is we don't have to measure the absolute energy content of anything. We only have to measure it relative to the standards. And that saves us a lot of time and a lot of calculation, which um, you don't understand really that much because you haven't delved into uh, quantum mechanical calculations just yet. I mean, you looked at them, you looked at quantum mechanics and what it is, but you haven't solved Schrodinger equation type uh, problems that would lead to absolute energies of systems of particles. It's, it's a mess. Um, so anyway, to get around that mess in general chemistry, we just assign zeros. So all the zeros in the periodic table are for those elements the way they exist. And then someone else goes along and um, measures taking the, the elements as they exist under standard condition and they form these compounds from those elements and then they get their delta H of formation which is defined from the standard. Taking, for example, this acetylene, C2H2, I need carbon and I need hydrogen. So I know that this is going to be formed uh, from hydrogen as a gas and carbon. Well, there's many different forms of carbon uh, and, and they exist under standard conditions. Diamond is one, graphite is another, Buckmiller fun, uh, fullerenes, C60 gas particles is another. So which one do you take? You take the graphite one. That's the one that's assigned zero because out of that list, it has the least amount of energy. So we assign that as zero. So we take hydrogen or somebody did in their lab and they, and they took graphite, they formed acetylene and they found experimentally that um, for each mole of acetylene that was formed, 26.7 kilojoules of energy, heat energy was given off. And so labs did this around the world and there's some agreement for these values which are published in your textbook or online. So now we have all of these delta H of formations which we can use uh, along with Hess's law to calculate um, the delta H of reactions involving these compounds. And we, we went along and and um, mentioned how to do that. If I can get this thing to advance, I'll show you. All right, there we go. And this was the equation that um, embodies this idea of using Hess's law along with delta H of formation. So the moral of the story is um, it's very interesting, the details of, of how you use those two concepts, but essentially 
you can get by in this class uh, calculating the delta H of any reaction using this formula. And this formula says you have to sum up, that's a sigma, big sigma means sum over all the delta H of formations of the products in a reaction, sum them all up, but since they're extensive, you have to multiply by the stoichiometric coefficients of each one of those products times their delta H of formation. So this is the delta H of formation per mole, and then you multiply it by how many moles. So you get the sum of all the energy for the products relative to the standards in the periodic table. You do the exact same thing for all the reactants. Then you take the difference because delta H is a state function. And that difference is equated to the change in the enthalpy for that reaction. So the application of this equation um, is all you need to know, I think, is most of what you need to know. But you should realize that it comes out of those two different concepts, Hess's law and this somewhat made up uh, man-made or woman-made um, idea of delta H of formation that sets all the elements as standards. It sets those as zero, but it's arbitrary. We could have set anything else zero as long as everybody knew what the zero was, we would get the same differences. Uh, so then we looked at an example of how to apply this idea for the combustion of propane. We take the products and their delta H of formations multiplied by their stoichiometric coefficients and add them up. And we do the same for the delta H of formation of the reactants add those up, take the difference, and that's what we get. Now, we, we also made a, a comment that you won't find the delta H of formation of oxygen gas because you should know that that's its standard state and anything in its standard state has a delta H of formation of zero. So you're not gonna find it in any of the tables. Um, and that's true for copper metal uh, for bromine liquid, for graphite, um, hydrogen gas, and so forth. They're all zero. Uh, all right, and so that was our recap. Any questions on that before we go on to just a little uh, bit of new material, something to think about, sleep on, and then we'll recap this, this stuff. All right, good. <clears throat> now, thermodynamics is the study of the energy criterion that goes into um, reactions. And, and in fact, thermodynamics is so general and so broad, the study of thermodynamics can tell you um, which processes, if any, will be spontaneous under the conditions uh, that they're at. And it's not just chemical processes, it's any processes in the universe. So it's really a fascinating uh, subject. And so we start off this, this plate here, uh, looking at diamond. And thermodynamics says that diamond should spontaneously convert to graphite, <clears throat> something relatively common and, and um, well, not as expensive as diamond. <clears throat> so why shouldn't you give away your diamonds? Does anybody know? According to thermodynamics, it should spontaneously convert to graphite. Okay, then give me your diamonds. 
I can use the extra cash. <laughs> um, the reason why, uh, and you, you know this, but maybe you don't know that, that you know it, that even though it's favored on energy grounds, um, it's not going to happen in our lifetime or even a couple lifetimes after. So that's what uh, I think um, jewelers are looking for. They're looking for impurities in the diamonds because there's this conversion to graphite. So you're looking for those dark spots in there. And that uh, means that your diamond isn't as worth as much because it has uh, graphite. So you might be thinking, well, geez, um, if diamond should spontaneously um, convert to graphite, then why does it exist at all? Does anybody know the answer to that? Is it relative to time? Well, that's why it's, it's um, yeah, it's not going to take place in your lifetime, this conversion, right? But why do diamonds form at all? Why is there a reaction that takes graphite and makes diamond? Um, doesn't that have to do with sure. pressure? Like yeah. if they're under a lot of pressure, it'll form. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So under extreme conditions, where do you find those at? Deep in the earth. Yes, it's over, like 100 miles down in the earth. And the temperature is like 2,000 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So it's at very extreme conditions that diamond form. And in fact, um, I was just looking on the internet and I found out that um, the diamonds that we find come from like volcanic activity. So they're brought up from deep down below towards the center of the earth, but it, they have to be brought up relatively fast in like a couple hours. They have to go through that hundred miles uh, or they'll turn back to graphite. And then once they come up, they cool down or freeze into that um, solid. And um, then they slowly go towards equilibrium, which is uh, towards graphite. And it's slow because remember, when we looked at, at um, the kinetics, one of the things we had to look at was the activation barrier and its height. So the activation barrier is going to be really like through the roof. So here's the energy, here's the reaction coordinate, right? And this is the EA. And the EA is related to the rate constant K. Um, remember, E to the minus EA over RT. And the larger this is, EA, the smaller the rate constant is. And um, I guess I got excited and I hit the wrong button. But anyway, uh, hopefully you have the, the idea of what's going on with diamond. Uh, any questions on that? So essentially, this chapter is going to tell us why reactions take place given certain conditions. And what are the conditions uh, maybe that we can reverse the reaction if possible? So I think you can see right off the bat that might be valuable information. Uh, so thermodynamics is uh, is fascinating uh, area. So before we get into the the details of that, though, we always have to go and and check out some of the the definitions. You know, what does it mean to spontaneous and irreversible, um, and, and things like that. So in in a thermodynamic sense, um, spontaneous has nothing to do with time. Uh, time criterion is in the kinetics realm, right? Anything dealing with time, we need to know, you know, about kinetics. 
what spontaneous means in a thermodynamic dynamic sense is that given these conditions, this process will take place without external influence. So that that diamond will convert back to graphite and nobody has to do anything. It's just going to happen under the conditions that that diamond exists. Uh, and that's what spontaneous means. Now, what does irreversible mean? Well, you think in, in the regular uh, vernacular of English, that means you, you can't put it back the way it is. But that's not what it means in a thermodynamic sense. What it means in a thermodynamic sense is that you can't put it back the way it was without uh, losing extra energy. Now, uh, let me try to explain that. So, so you can do it, but it's going to cost you more energy. Um, say you have a rock that's uh, very close to a cliff, okay? Now, that rock is, it, given those conditions, that rock will spontaneously drop down to the valley, we don't know when, that's a, a kinetics uh, problem. But thermodynamically, it's favored to, to go in that direction. The rock's going to fall down the side of the hill and end up in the valley. And that's said to be a spontaneous and irreversible process. And you go, well, hold the phone. I could take that rock and I could drive it back up and put it right back into the same spot but that's gonna cost me more energy and therefore more money um, to do that than I could have uh, extracted from that natural process. Well, how can you extract energy from that natural process? Well, you can imagine that maybe you tied a rope onto the rock. So when it did fall down the, the side of the slope, the rock uh, spun some copper windings and a magnetic field and it generated electricity okay, from that motion. That electricity energy that you generated isn't enough to, you know, put in your electric car to bring back up and put it in, in the place. You need more. And that's what irreversible means. In fact, there are no completely reversible processes. And that leads to uh, Stephen Hawkins' Uh, his book, The Arrow of Time. Um, we're, we, you know, we're using up resources um, and you just can't replace it. And you can always look towards this one thermodynamic property to show you um, how those, how the universe is unwinding. And we're going to get to that thermodynamic property. Uh, it's called entropy. Um, anyway, that's kind of the, the skinny on spontaneous and irreversible. Uh, any questions on that? All righty. So we want to look at the energy of reactions, right? Because this is chemistry and all those other processes are very interesting and and related, but we want to focus on chemical reactions and the factors that uh, make them spontaneous, okay? So one of the things we notice in reactions that are spontaneous is, is that um, delta H is negative, okay? So energy is given off, and that might seem reasonable to you, and that might um, indicate that it's all uh, based on energy. Uh, a reaction is spontaneous based off of energy. And that would be misleading. For example, here's a reaction that's endothermic, but it takes place spontaneous, uh, spontaneously. So if I place some solid ammonium nitrate uh, in water, 
it absorbs heat from the water and it dissolves spontaneously. So here is an example of an endothermic process. So most processes that are exothermic are spontaneous and that's kind of a hint in the right direction, but it's not the complete picture. There's something else uh, going on here. And it turns out to be none other than entropy. So what is this thing that we call entropy? Uh, in short, entropy is most accurately described um, as the dispersion of energy and or particles. That's what uh, entropy is. Uh, and, and I say about relatively recently, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, uh, a lot of the general chemistry textbooks have been rewritten and that used to have a different definition of entropy when I was in your shoes taking the class, which is shied away from and no longer used. So I'm not gonna mention it because I don't wanna confuse you, but entropy is a measure of the dispersion of energy and or particles uh, in a process, okay? And so things that increase entropy or processes or chemical reactions that increase processes tend to be spontaneous. Uh, I'm sorry, that increase entropy uh, tend to be spontaneous. And so we'll get mo more on this in the second law when we look at the second law of thermodynamics, uh, which is, I think, the most important of all the laws uh, as far as spontaneity of, of a process goes. All right, so before we get to um, that, let's think about what um, entropy is and how we can recognize uh, when it increases or when it decreases. Okay, so this plate talks about ice. And we know that ice uh, exists in different forms depending on the conditions, uh, namely the temperature. So above room temperature, the process of ice um, is that it melts. It spontaneously converts from solid to liquid. But below um, uh, zero degrees, uh, did I say room temperature? I meant zero degrees. Um, below zero degrees uh, Celsius, ice, uh, I'm sorry, water spontaneously converts from the liquid to the ice phase, which implies that entropy must be connected to temperature in some way, right? So the entropy requirements for a process is connected to the temperature at which that process takes place. So we keep that in the back of our minds and that'll come up later on uh, when we look at uh, entropy and chemical reactions. Here's some other um, statements that are true and that can be connected to this idea of dispersion of energy and or particles. The first one, a hot pan disperses some energy to a cooler air in the room. So that heat energy comes from the hot pan and uh, heats up the particles in the room. And we could imagine that uh, those particles are moving faster and spreading out. Uh, and that can be associated with an increase in entropy. Now you take a cool room. A cool room can give some heat energy, even though it's cool, to ice cubes, which are colder in the room and help melt uh, those cubes and spread out the particle of water in there. And again, that process leads to an increase of entropy. And both of those processes take place spontaneously. In other words, they just happen without external influence. Uh, we also know that higher pressures in balloons tend to leak out eventually. That balloon deflates 
and it happens spontaneously. You could just leave it alone. And as time goes on, uh, the pressure is going to equalize. So it seems like, and, and this is where it's connected to equilibrium, all processes do go towards equilibrium. And in the process, if it's a spontaneous process, entropy is created. Batteries, they have some concentration of chemicals. They go towards equilibrium as they lose their charge and it becomes zero, where their chemical uh, is balanced in some way. So at the uh, microscopic level, we often talk about uh, energy being spread out in the molecule. And this molecule has to um, disperse that energy throughout its, its atoms and its bonds. And it can do it differently, as we'll see in a second or two. Uh, and each different way that it can spread out that energy is called the microstate. It's a, it's, a, it's a subatomic picture. It's nothing that we can see with our eyes. We only see the macroscopic, um, but we can imagine what would happen because of the model of the atom. Uh, so anyway, we'll get back to the microstates a little bit. It's a, it, it's a little bit out of the range of a Chem 201 class. Uh, it, it's more of an upper division class, but that's okay. Uh, we'll jump across the boundary back and forth a little bit. So entropy. Entropy, again, uh, you know, spreading out of particles and or energy. So say I have the same number of particles in each one of these situations. I have gas and I have liquid and I have, ha I'm sorry, gas is over here, liquid in the middle, solid all the way over here. Um, which one of these would you guess has the most amount of entropy? Yes. Yeah, sure. Because of the definition of entropy, right? Um, it's defined as a spreading out of particles. So you see that the gas particles are moving all over the place, bouncing off the, the walls of the container. Whereas the liquid, the liquid's moving, but it's sliding, the particles are sliding over each other. Whereas solid, they're, they're kind of locked in position. Does that mean they're not moving at all? in the solid? No. No, it doesn't, right? W what are the motions in the solid? They're just like small vibrations, right? Right, correct. Uh, are there any situations where um, there's uh, motionless particles or, or molecules? Isn't that, that a be perfect a, crystal? Absolute zero or? Uh, yeah, absolute zero. Yeah, you guys are, are right on it. Um, let me ask you, has absolute zero Kelvin ever been attained? No. No, it hasn't. So it's a theoretical uh, idea, but you're right. A at this um, situation, we postulate theoretically that there would be no motion. But as soon as you add temperature in, as soon as you add some heat and that temperature rises, then uh, you have a subsequent um, motion taking place, whether it's the atom spinning around or vibrating or whatever. Uh, all right, so you should be able to answer these questions uh, or, or blanks, fill in the blanks. Uh, any process that increases the number of gas molecules leads to a blank in entropy. Increase? Yeah, sure. So something's going from a liquid or a solid into a gas, you would expect entropy to increase. For example, um, take a look at this reaction here. It's all gas in the reactants and products. I have two moles of NO 
and one mole of O2. So that's a total of three moles of gas on the left and two moles of gas on the right. So the question is, is entropy increasing or decreasing in this process? What would you guess? Decreasing? Less yeah. gas, less. Yep, you got it, you guys. So less gas, uh, less entropy. So what would the sign of delta S be? If it's decreasing. Negative. Yeah, okay, so good. See, we're just, we're, just, we're just getting used to these ideas and connecting them to the thermodynamic process. So, you know, it's still kind of iffy, but as you look at this and, and think about it, it'll start coming easier and easier to you and you'll be able to recognize situations where entropy increases and decreases. And that's why we're, we're taking these steps slow. So in general, then, the total number of gas molecules in a reaction decreases the entropy decreases. Yes, sir. Um, and then at the, the molecular level, um, we can compare the, the motions of the reactants compared to the products. And that is what we believe is attributed to the difference in entropy. Okay. So now <clears throat> we're talking about microstates here, and it's kind of abstract, but I'm, I'm going to try to make it less abstract for you with, with this explanation and these pictures. So at the molecular level, which we can't see, but we can imagine that there's different ways to use energy. So if you have a, a certain amount of energy, that could go into moving the molecule in the container. You know, it's flying around in the container, bouncing off the, the walls. We call that translational motion, right? So that energy, say the molecule gets hit by another molecule and it's, it shoots off. That's translational. Now, say the, the molecule just happens to be pinned up against the, the side of the wall and it gets hit by that same other molecule and given the same amount of energy, we can imagine that maybe it vibrates and it doesn't go into translational energy. So the bonds in that molecule, this molecule here that we have pictured is a simple water molecule, you can have vibrations that are taking place. So this is an example of one of the possible vibrations. It's called a rocking vibration, but you can have wagging vibrations where, you know, both of the bonds or the hydrogens go towards each other and then away. That's another type of vibration and so forth. Or you can imagine that the molecule uh, comes along this one and hits another and it just hits maybe one of the hydrogens and it spins around its axis. So it gives it the same amount of energy as the others, but now it's spinning. So these are all different possible ways for that energy to be distributed in a molecule. And that's different microstates. Now, that the, the different ways that the, the molecule can move, um, we know are 3n degrees of freedom. Now, how do we know that it's 3n? Simply, it's the Cartesian coordinate system. So for each atom, uh, each atom has three ways that it can move in the Cartesian coordinate system. Plus and minus x is one, plus and minus y is another, plus and minus z uh, is a, another motional uh, way. So if I put it like a Cartesian coordinate system on this hydrogen right here, then uh, X <coughs> cross Y gives me Z. And I have the three different ways it can move for that one. And then there's three atoms. 
So water would have nine degrees of freedom. All right. And so th this is just an idea of what microstates uh, might look like as far as uh, energy distributed in them. This is an extra explanation if you want to read it. Uh, it's in the notes. Um, and it introduces Boltzmann and his uh, definition of entropy. In fact, this, is, this equation is on his tombstone in Paris, I believe. <clears throat> anyway, um, if you want to read more about microstates, then check it out. But back to uh, Chem 201, uh, let's look at uh, these microstates again and try to predict uh, how entropy will change in these different situations. All right, now, if I have some molecule, let's say heptane, it's got um, seven carbons and 16 hydrogens. It's in the gas phase. Uh, and, and it has a certain amount of energy at a certain temperature. Well, if I add energy by increasing the temperature, how will the molecular motions change and how will entropy change from the the definition of entropy, which is a spreading out of particles and or um, energy. What do you think? Increased temperature, what happens to entropy? It also increases. Yeah, that's exactly correct. And you might think so because you know a little bit more about microstates now, uh, the more energy you have spread out here, you can imagine, say, you know, these bonds are going to stretch even further. So this atom not only can exist here and maybe here, but at more energy, it could stretch out even further. And so there's more ways to distribute the energy in vibrations, rotations, or translations um, at higher temperature. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So it should make sense that as temperature increases, entropy of a system would increase. All right, how about this, this uh, situation where we take different compounds? Let's take uh, methane, ethane, and propane. So the difference between these systems is obviously uh, they increase in the number of atoms and the complexity. So how would um, entropy compare if we gave the same energy for each one of these systems, which one would have more entropy or which one would have uh, another way to look at it, uh, more access to different positions? C3H8? Yes. So it would increase as complexity increases because there's more microstates. There's more possible positions that those atoms can exist in just because there's more atoms. Okay. And uh, how about the solid example uh, where we take at the same temperature, we take a magnesium oxide solid versus a sodium fluoride solid. And here's the solid um, crystal structures here and here. So you see, they kind of look uh, very similar to each other the, as far as positions in the crystal lattice. Uh, we see uh, interactions like along here, uh, some bonding, ionic bonding going on here. Over here, we have the same type of ionic bonding here and here. Uh, 
we just have to replace maybe this is the oxygen and here's the fluorine this would be na and this would be magnesium so they're kind of in the same positions uh, and we have to figure out which one has more entropy in other words uh, can this atom move further than say this atom here based off of their interactions. So now we're, we're talking about uh, bond strengths within a crystal lattice. So how can we get it the force uh, at which uh, crystals are held together? One way to do that is to look at Coulomb's law, which says the force between two charged particles is directly proportional to uh, the charge over the distance squared, okay? Now, the distances are going to be pretty similar for these systems because magnesium 2 plus and oxygen minus 2, Na plus 1, F minus. Um, if you look at the periodic table, they're all uh, isoelectronic with neon, so they're all going to have about the same Bohr radius because they're, they're all isoelectronic. They have the same electronic structure as neon, F minus and Na plus, magnesium two plus and oxygen two minus. They all have the same electronic structure, the same number of electrons as neon. So um, the electrons in these interactions are, are going to be pretty much the same, right? It's the charges that are going to be different. So in one case, you're going to have plus one minus one. In the other case, you're going to have uh, plus two minus two. So the force is going to be greater in which one of these crystals? Magnesium oxide. Yes, because in, in fact, it's going to be two times two is four versus one. It's going to be about four times greater. Assuming that the distances between the ions are around the same. Um, yeah, so these bonds in magnesium uh, oxide are going to be uh, tighter and stronger and stiffer. These interactions between oppositely charged uh, atoms. So you wouldn't expect the motion to be as great as something that's weaker in its interactions. So which one would you say has more entropy? Moves their atoms in more locations. The sodium chloride? Yeah check. So that's the reasoning anyway. Any questions on that? Okay, so we're just trying to get an idea of what entropy is uh, and how we can recognize it and how we can recognize changes in entropy in, in different environments and different systems, uh, mostly related to chemical uh, reactions. Now, the last thing I want to to talk about before um, I stop blabbing is this plate. And this plate is about solvolysis of the solid. So here I have some salt down here with um, cations and anions. And then I have water molecules here dissolving the, the um, ions. So my question is first, uh, how does the entropy change for the solid when it goes from solid, from the solid to the liquid? How does the entropy change? It increases. Yes. Now, why? It's going from a more stable state to a state with more, uh, I guess, chaos or entropy, like it's going to a less stable state. <laughs> uh, see you 
you used the old terminology chaos. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> See, that's what they took out of the, the general chem text. And I was trying to get away from it. But yeah, that's what we used to we used to call it that. But now we call it a more spreading out of, of atoms or particles. Oh, right? okay. <laughs> Yeah, so it's spread out, uh, and sometimes that's they, they call that it's more random, right? Um, uh, or disorder. That's a that's a big, I think no no that's the worst way, way you can describe it, uh, because <laughs> because what is order to some people? You walk into their office and you're like, oh my god, it's a mess. Uh, and they go, no, everything is where it should be. I know exactly where it is. So it's kind of personal order, right? So you can't describe entropy as order or disorder. That's that's what they took out of the, the textbooks or chaos and 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 order, right? Um, so yeah, uh, you're right. It's more, as far as the solid is concerned, this is um, less spread out than that solid would be if it was in the water. So entropy for the solid increases. So then the natural question, the follow-up question is, why do some solids not dissolve? Does anybody uh, want to take a shot at that? No. All right, then that's where I want to end, unless you really want to know why. <laughs> okay, you want to think about it? Okay, you got it. I had a question for the exam. Oh, okay, shoot. Uh, the syllabus has it coming online at 11. Is there any way to do it? sooner than that yes um can you send me an email and, and i'll put it on what time you want it seven in the morning or yeah, i'd what? probably start around seven or eight yeah y yeah just shoot me an email i mean i would even I'll do it on friday if that was a thing um you know what i'm just gonna do it right now yeah yeah i'll do it before i leave my office change exam to seven to 7 a.m. All right, cool. Anything else? Yep, thanks. That's awesome. Awesome. You guys have any questions for me? For the top of my head? <laughs> Got I have a couple. I'm just going to fight. Okay. I think you're okay. muted. So. Oh, you're waiting for, does anyone else have questions? Oh, thanks. Thanks, Professor. I'm going to go get my, my first COVID shot right now, actually. So, All right. <laughs> yeah. All right, bye, then. guys. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Professor. Have a good one. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor. You got it.